there's like one like nugget takeaway somewhere between color coding the calendar and scheduling the self-care first and then asking yourself what does that look like for that self-care to be non-negotiable what agreements do you need to have with the people in your life or with yourself i was joking with my community the other day that when i started at my new yoga studio a couple months ago like the first month i really paid attention to how long it took me to like change my clothes and grab my yoga mat and drive over there and park do all of that because now I know I can like literally drop what I'm doing and be there on time to class in 20 minutes. And that's the mm. difference in me sitting here and having the micro decision of like, oh, I'm cutting it kind of close. Am I going to make it? I don't know. And like just knowing confidently that I can make it. And this is my point. I'm either getting up from this computer right now or I'm missing yoga and being able to make those snap decisions and uphold the future identity of Sandra the Yogi. Hi, I'm Biz Kush a life coach and therapist, and your host here on the Awaken Your Wise Woman podcast. We're talking to women all over the world who found their way back to themselves, to their inner knowing, to their intuition, to their wisest self. We're exploring how to feel alive, authentic, engaged, and fully present in your life. Let's awaken your wise woman. Hi there. I am super excited about this episode of the Awaken Your Wise Woman podcast. But before we get started, I just wanted to say hi. Welcome back. I am Biz Kush and the host of this podcast. And again, like each time I have another guest on the show, I'm just so appreciative of this platform of connecting with other women, other amazingly wise women, and sharing those conversations with you. And if you had insight about wanting to know more on a particular topic, you can always reach out to me through email through the website. There's a contact form there and you can shoot me an email and let me know what you want to hear. But this week, we're talking to Sandra Holling, uh, once again, loved the conversation, loved her focus for her business. And I just have to share one thing she said in our conversation that just touches me deeply because I am a to-do list person. She says, yeah, I think it's very startling when we realize that if we are the type of people that have a to-do list, the odds are good that we will die with a to-do list. So think about that, women out there who love their to-do lists. I also want to say that her wisdom at the end of the episode about giving yourself permission to make your needs a priority and how that helps others is just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So if you want to know all about the podcast, what episodes are new and live and you would like that, delivered directly to your inbox, you can reach out and sign up for the newsletter. And with that newsletter, you get some free writing prompts, but uh, you also get the newsletter in your inbox once a week, which is pretty amazing. Two podcasts a month, a longer essay from me once a month, and just some insights into what I'm doing and what I'm thinking about and what I'm reading. You can sign up at elizabethcushcoaching.com forward slash sign up. Here's a little bit more about Sandra. Sandra Halling is a recovering corporate consultant turned anti-hustle, pro-equity, productivity coach. She's dedicated to helping heart-centered entrepreneurs, passionate academics, and mission-driven professionals Find harmony between genuine self-care and getting stuff done. Sandra is a systems expert on platforms like Notion and Airtable, but her real priority is helping you develop better work habits by achieving aligned productivity. That is to say, aligning your work with your values so you feel calm, confident, and can prioritize what matters to you. Sounds like a perfect fit for the podcast because we're all about being aligned and accessing your wisest self so that you can live in a more centered, confident, calm way. And if we can make that happen through our work as well as our lives, 
I am all about it. And in our conversation today, Sandra shares about bringing intuition into your strategy with your business, about non-toxic hustle culture, bringing gentleness into your business and your work. Think about that, ladies, women out there, my wise women, gentleness, bringing gentleness into your work. There's a concept. So this conversation is packed full of great stuff. I hope you enjoy it. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Sandra Holling. Hi, Sandra, and welcome to the Awaken Your Wise Woman podcast. Hi, Biz. Thanks for having me. It's so nice to have you here, and I'm excited to jump into our conversation. But for the listeners who don't know who you are, could you share a little bit about yourself and uh, what you do? Yeah, sure. So I am basically a recovering corporate consultant. <laughs> I spent a lot of years implementing fancy systems for architects and engineers. And then time went on, I was working in the same application for about almost 20 years. And I got to a point where I realized the hardest part about corporate consulting, other than managing client expectations, was really setting up my own systems and technology and running my business in a way that did not feel like I was beholden to the systems, <laughs> like that mm. I was able to operate with a, a solid mix of intuition and strategy. And I found over and over again that that's a lot harder to hold than people might realize at first. And so I am 100% a hyphenate entre entrepreneur. I have a group coaching program called Align Productivity, where we work on the non- toxic hustle culture, like get rid of all of the, the messaging and find what our funny equation is for feeling good at the end of the day, week, month, quarter. We look at planning from a seasonal perspective and find gentleness and create permission for self-care in addition to getting things done. That's one side of my business. And then the other side is I'm still a nerd at heart. And so I really do enjoy setting up systems for other entrepreneurs I basically take the tech and the marketing systems and just get that out of the way so that you can be more visible and have the impact that you want. Wow. Wow. So a few things that you said that I wrote down while we were chatting, but like intuition and strategy, non-toxic hustle culture and gentleness, like, okay, when we talk about business and we talk about entrepreneurship, those are not necessarily, some of those words aren't necessarily what we usually hear, right? Mm -hmm. It's like push, 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 get out there, really hustle. But you're saying we can do this without all that. A hundred percent. You can do it without all that. And in fact, I think that it's kind of a mission. It's like, it can be part of our mission as women entrepreneurs to embrace a different way of being because whether you only are looking to have a solopreneurship with a VA or whatever, and you want to keep things small, or whether you want to grow an empire, wherever you are on that spectrum, we can be culture makers and change makers and create experiences for clients or experiences for employees and contractors that are wildly different than anything they've had before. And so it kind of falls into that bucket of like being the change that you want to see, right? As the cliche yeah. goes. Yeah. And so in terms of how I approach the anti-hustle bit, I think it's cultivating nuance and the ability to hold paradox. So it is true that action is what gets you results in your business, like that brass tacks. Action gets you results. Passive action, consuming content, as much as we want people to consume our content, right? Consuming content is information gathering. It is not action. Action is what gets you results. And at the same time, the pace of that action and the energetic expression of that action can be aligned to you and where you are and the season of life that you're in and all of those other pieces that tend to just not even be on the radar screen when we're talking about corporate America. Yeah, yeah. So I want to talk more about that, but like what got you to this point of, I need to do things differently, one, for your own business, but also to nurture this mindset for other entrepreneurs, like mm -hmm. what, and, and other people in business? Yeah. So I have 
I had an interesting life, I think you could say is one way to, to frame it. I have a good sense of humor about it, but I also often joke that sometimes I tell my life story and it sounds like a lifetime TV movie or something, right? Me too. Multiple yeah. miscarriages, death in the mm -hmm. family, just like all situations of grieving that really caught me off guard at points in my business that were awkward and high test. And those two things did not match, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that that was a big piece of it. My own health journey has been a challenge. Like I have chronic, like we were talking before the show, I'm getting over a sinus infection. I have chronic sinusitis and it will knock me out of commission for six weeks, eight weeks sometimes. And like, oh that's rough, right? So, and I, I had sinus surgery a few years back and there've been other things related to that that have been really challenging. So it was just realizing the amount of buffer space that I needed to actually have space for my real actual life and be able to run my business sustainably did not look like what people were telling me it should look like. <laughs> and so it's yeah. like, okay, I need to decide for myself what this is going to look like, which is a big premise that I follow in the coaching program that I offer is there is methodology, but the curriculum would like fit in a teaspoon because it, I don't want it to be something where like, I'm not teaching people productivity hacks. I think productivity hacks are pretty stupid. <laughs> I have methodologies for sure. I have strategies. I might even have some tactics for you. We draw the line at hacks because it's just like, I want people to be able to assess for themselves. Oh, this is an interesting idea. This is a different way of thinking about this. I could reframe this so that I'm not beating up on myself. Mm -hmm. I basically teach people how to be nicer to themselves and get shit done. <laughs> like that's the combination. <laughs> right? I love that. I love that. Yeah. So there have been grief situations and challenging health situations, multiple moves in the mix. There was one particular day though that always sticks out in my mind where it had been a rough week and a rough day. And it was like Friday at four o'clock and I had planned to go to a yoga class and the work that I wanted to have done that week was just not done, right? Mm -hmm. And then I had to pause and say, is it not done to my specifications or is this not done in a way that the client's actually going to be impacted by it, right? Mm -hmm. And I really had to pause and, and think about what does done look like for me and where, is, where am I confusing perfection or polishing with done for now? And how much permission do I have to iterate and experiment intentionally. And so there's been this somewhat long bumpy road <laughs> between that moment, that aha, and where I am now, where I prioritize intentional experimentation and iterating and polishing and done for now over the previous version of how I handled my work. Mm, yeah, because I know that the sort of the perfectionism side can just lead it to never feel done enough, but also overworking, overburdening, getting burnt out. And But I like just being intentional and good enough, which I think, I mean, probably men too, but I work with primarily women. That, that's, that sense of good enough doesn't mean it's not good. Mm -hmm. right? And that's the hardest I mean, thing. That's the hardest thing yeah. to like recalibrate because we're taught in school and in like air quote, regular jobs, whatever that means that, you know, a quality work is what people are looking for when the reality is that most of us are experts in our fields, especially if we're solopreneurs or running small businesses. And so if you're an expert in your field, the difference between your version of B minus and your version of A plus is probably only perceptible to you and people at your level. It's not going to be perceptible to your client. And in fact, that difference is also often there's like this 80 20 rule where the last 20 percent of the project takes 80 percent of the time. And it's because mm -hmm. we're down into the weeds and trying to perfect something. And I think it begs the question of what is the impact of the difference that we're trying to make here. It's not like, will it make a difference? Because we know as experts, this is where we get hung up. We know it will, right, to us. Right, right. And so we have to sort of back ourselves out of that and look at it, zoom out, look at it from the client's perspective, look at it from the user's perspective. From a, I'm a consultant, so I think of users. Mm -hmm. And say, what is their experience going to be? Right. And am I optimizing for their experience or am I optimizing based on an idealized version of what I think they want? 
yeah. right? Yeah. I think those yeah. are all pieces that fall into there. And the other thing I'll highlight too is I knew I was a perfectionist. I constantly referred to myself as a recovering perfectionist, but for a long time, it was an intellectualized version of that, right? And so I'm sure that you have smarty pants clients and smarty pants listeners, because I'm a smarty pants. I bet you're a smarty pants, right? And like, oh, I totally right? am. And, and so like, we know that we're recovering perfectionists on one level, but like the embodied permission to just let it go is that's a, just a different ball game. Totally different ball game because that embodied, you know, letting go of that perfectionism and need for it to be just right. It's the difference between feeling totally stressed out, letting it go, and being like, "Okay, here we are. This is good enough. Whatever it mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. is good enough the way it is, and it's good." Yeah. 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 It's funny you mentioned that because one of my newest members in the community in the coaching program, she said to me the other day that the biggest game changer for her has been to think about how she wants to feel at the end of the day and at the end of the week, as opposed to thinking about what got done and what didn't get done. Right. Mm -hmm. So we do in our, we have a weekly review process. I hosted on Fridays a couple of times. And so we all meet on zoom and we go through this journaling template. It's like a reflection journaling template. And some of it is very practical, like what got done? What didn't? Where are you on your focus projects? What's next? What are the needle movers? That kind of stuff. But there's the bulk of it, the the beginning and the end, it's, it's sandwiched with these questions around how do you want to feel, right? What are you celebrating? What needs to be acknowledged? Where did you put yourself first? How are you acknowledging the things that were hard? And I think that the piece around permission here is so important because we're all of this generation that was taught not to brag, right? And True. right, it's like, it's not bragging if you really did it. So I want you to be a, a robust truth teller when you're doing your weekly review, like name the things because what it does is, in my experience, it builds this proof that you're doing way more than you think you are, right? Which also helps when you have a moment where you can't do as much because you have proof that you did more than you thought you were going to last month. And like, it starts to even out and you start to have not only a better sense of what your capacity really is and a better ability to predict what you will be able to do, but like more permission to not hold it so tightly because you know you have the habits in place to be able to assess more accurately what is really happening. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it feels like, I mean, I know you're talking about helping business owners in your coaching program, but it feels like life too, right? I mean, it's like, as we get used to and pay attention to like, these were good days, mm -hmm. these were not so good mm -hmm. days or bad days, but it's not all good and all bad. We do have this ebb and flow of mm -hmm. our mood, what's happening in our life, our life experiences. And mm -hmm. I think understanding that it, for most people, it does balance, right? It's like, it's not all good or bad. Mm -hmm. It's not all productivity or slacking and laziness. Mm -hmm. It's like, we do it all and it all gets done. Absolutely. And I think that there's also an element here too of when we allow ourselves to acknowledge what we're doing and celebrate what we're doing and acknowledge where things are sticky or hard or not going the way we wanted or expected, we're able to calibrate as we go and make those sort of smaller incremental changes, incremental shifts. If we only ever plan once a year or once a month or once a quarter, the smaller shifts are much harder to handle. Whereas if we're, it's kind of like that adage where, if you don't have time to meditate for 20 minutes, you should meditate for an hour. And the same thing applies with planning. Like if you don't have time to plan for 20 minutes then you probably should plan for an hour because the prep work that happens in a planning process, a good planning process takes all that decision fatigue and what I call initial inertia when you're starting a task and you're like, you just can't quite get over that hurdle. Mm -hmm. It softens all of it so much that you are able to take more aligned actions in smaller amounts of time without burning yourself out and have permission to stick to your work hours and not burn yourself out and work weekends. And it, it starts to be this like reverse avalanche where it's like rolling the right direction, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's like, it's like 
you're sowing the seeds so the the things grow in a way that yeah. really sustain yeah. you and last. How do you see, I mean, the clients that come to you, like I think about the work culture that has been in place, this sort of white man work culture of do, 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 work, 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 patriarchal push. That is so not, it's not my capacity. It's not who I am as a person. And I think I can get sucked into these ideas of, how big I should be planning or how much I should be packing into my day when really I know I work better and cleaner and more efficiently if I have space in my day. Mm -hmm. Are you finding that with other uh, women in particular, I guess? Yeah. I mean, that story is is so common. And what I want to offer is if we kind of zoom backwards in history and we think about where our work schedule actually came from, It was originated in the Industrial Revolution where people were doing monotonous activities that were physical labor, not intellectual activities that were creative in nature. And so Mm. there's a lot of studies, you can Google this if you want, but there's a lot of studies that say knowledge work, creative work, which is what most of us are doing now, the most that you can do it effectively for is about four hours a day, right? And I would say that rings true for me. I Anything less than three hours and I'm not going to get deep enough into whatever technical nuance thing I'm doing to really feel like I made solid progress. And at about four hours, I start doing what I call leaving myself breadcrumbs. So kind of like Hansel and Gretel. It's, what are the pieces that I have finished and what is remaining that I want to pick up with next time? And it's, it's sort of a tying things off in bows and, and wrapping up loose ends, but It's just as much preparing for whatever the next work session is going to look like. And Mm. those nuances of planning beforehand, leaving myself breadcrumbs and having white space around my focus time, those are the game changers for me feeling easeful in that planning block, right? Mm. And and that, that is the spaciousness that you speak of for me in my world. Yeah, yeah. I do too. Like I hear a lot of my clients sort of talking about managing their like to-do list, like what it is that's on the agenda, whether it's for the day or the week or just in their life. And I often try to reflect back, like the to-do list is always going to be there, right? I mean, it's never, no matter how many things you cross off, it's not going anywhere. You're always adding. There's always more, whether it's stuff around your home or for your business or in your life. And so how do you help people, your clients manage that sort of idea of this ever sort of everlasting list of Mm -hmm. things you need to do? Yeah, I think it's very startling when we realize that if we are the type of people that have a to-do list, the odds are good that we will die with a to-do list. (laughs) And that's like a startling (laughs) thing to think about. So I lead with that because it like shakes our reality a little bit. (laughs) Joking aside, I say a couple of things. One is compartmentalizing the to-do list into areas or domains. So just like when you're cooking Thanksgiving dinner, you put something on the front burner and you work with it for a while, but then like it just needs to simmer. So you move it to the back burner, right? And then you put something else on the front burner. And we all do this when we're cooking a large meal. Well, same thing is true in your life. There are some times where your relationship, your primary relationship needs to be on the front burner and growing your business needs to be on the back burner. And so maybe you're doing the routine task, but you're not doing some new experiment. Whereas like you're really prioritizing ending work every day and twice a week date night or whatever it is that you're doing to grow that relationship. Mm -hmm. So it's really about kind of focus areas, if you will. And then even within the business or within your personal life, you can have micro areas. So In Align Productivity, I use Notion and teach Notion as a tool for managing this. And one of the reasons I like Notion for this kind of stuff is because you can have dashboards. So inside of my personal productivity system, like I have a dashboard for creativity. I have a dashboard for Mm -hmm. health. And when I go to those pages, I see things that prompt me to read a book that I've been meaning to read in that space, or my recipe list might be there or whatever it is. The other great thing about Notion from a personal productivity standpoint is 
I manage some aspects of my business there, but it is not the primary place where I manage my business and I don't have my team in there. So it really is mm. my place to like be messy. And I think that permission has been huge for me because for a while I did manage the business out of Notion, but it just felt like I had to be very careful about where I kept personal things and just that organization, it was costing me more than it was adding. And so there is something to be said for having a tool or a system that works for you that allows you to spread things out and also to be able to hone in, right? So it's like, see the big picture, but zoom in at the same time. And I think that's a unique skill and often helpful with a buddy, whether you're working with a consultant or a coach or a friend or even just your partner to, to think about, have someone else reflect back to you. What are you saying your values are? And are the actions and the tasks and the way you're spending your money even like if you look at your calendar, you look at your task list and you look at your spending, that's going to tell you what your values are, or it's going to tell you how you're showing up. And maybe it's telling you that you want to put more effort into some values, but they're not there yet. Right. And that can be a big clue also. So in addition yeah. to the sort of dashboard and compartmentalization and thinking about things in domains or areas, I also talk a lot about leaning into your future identity. So is your future identity a successful business owner? And like, what does that mean to you, right? Because that means something mm -hmm. different to all of us. Or is it a really active parent? Maybe there's some version of that that feels really important. And, and that's going to change seasonally, especially for women. As we go through our life, what feels most important is going to shift. And having space for that also can allow us to decide, okay, here's the bigger picture to-do list. Here are the things that are on the front burner. Here are the things that are kind of on the middle burner that I might swap out depending on my mood or how I'm feeling. Like maybe I want to focus more on fitness versus creativity or whatever. And then mm -hmm. here are the things that are more like long range that I'm going to check in with every quarter or so and say, does this need to move to the front burner? Is it is the time now? And that's where that mix of intuition and strategy come from. Right. It's like, mm -hmm. do we want to map things out so that we have the lay of the land and we don't have to start from scratch every time? I do think there's value in that. But then when it comes time to the decision making and the prioritization, I think trusting your instinct is really important. Oh, yeah. 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 And having the I like the idea of things on the back burner and things on the long range simmer. You know, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that that's a nice idea. Nice imagery in terms of managing all there is to do. So with sort of bringing self-care into this picture of work life and work life balance, what would you suggest to people who struggle with that? Yeah. So the first thing I always suggest is that I think we should let go of the idea of balance because I think it's a myth, kind of like perfection mm. is a myth. I think it came from corporate culture. So that tells you the motivation, right? Like their idea of self-care is rest on the weekend so you can come back and work some more. And we can throw mm -hmm. that out the window if we want to, right? So that's, right. that's kind of right. square one. And then from there, I would say when you're looking at your to-do list, and particularly when you're looking at your calendar, like I always encourage people to color code their calendar if they're not already, because just looking at that can start to indicate to you where your energy is going like at a, at a glance if you're thinking about the colors associated with tasks or areas of your life or business you know you can start to feel how much are you going to need to show up for whatever you have on your plate in that moment so that can really help if i see a wall of meetings like you know my meetings are teal on my color if i see that i'm like okay this is imbalanced like let's add in some you know orange which is workouts or whatever it is Okay. So it's like a visual indicator that I find really helpful. And then the other thing is like when you're looking at your to-do list and saying like, okay, what on here is actually for me, right? Mm -hmm. And even the things that are like for our clients, we can reframe them so they're for us. And I think that's a really powerful thing because if we're doing client deliverables or whatever that don't actually feel good to us, eventually that's going to breed resentment anyhow. Mm -hmm. So knowing why we're doing the things that we're doing is really valuable. And part of our weekly review process is looking at 
not just what are your tasks, like your to-do items, but what is your mental, f- physical, spiritual, emotional self-care plan? And mm. I always encourage people like schedule that stuff first, because if it's not on the calendar first, if you don't, no one is going to prioritize you first if you don't. That's so true. Plain and simple. So scheduling yeah. the self-care first. I think if there's like one like nugget takeaway somewhere between color coding the calendar and scheduling the self-care first and then asking yourself, what does that look like for that self-care to be non-negotiable? What agreements do you need to have with the people in your life or with yourself? I was joking with my community the other day that when I started my new yoga studio a couple months ago, like the first month I really paid attention to how long it took me to like change my clothes and grab my yoga mat and drive over there and park do all of that because now I know I can like literally drop what I'm doing and be there on time to class in 20 minutes. And that's the Mm. difference in me sitting here and having the micro decision of like, I'm cutting it kind of close. Am I going to make it? I don't know. And like just knowing confidently that I can make it. And this is my point. I'm either getting up from this computer right now or I'm missing yoga and being able to make those snap decisions and uphold the future identity of Sandra the yogi right? Like it all starts Mm -hmm. to tie together, Mm -hmm. right? These pieces. And this is what I mean when I say it's not so much curriculum as it is strategies and tactics and like ways of thinking about things that knit together in a way that's a lot gentler. Yeah. And really allows you to sort of show up as yourself in your business, but in your life too, Mm -hmm. which is amazing. Mm -hmm. So if there were a piece of wisdom that you would like to share with the wise women out there listening, what might that be? A piece of wisdom. I would say permission is the word that keeps coming up for me lately. And it's, I think the the key piece around permission is every single time you give yourself permission to do something, you are giving permission to everyone else around you, right? Mm. And that was a game changer for me, particularly around people pleasing which is a tricky one. A lot of, I think it goes with the perfectionism. It's like part of high functioning anxiety is like the fawn response or the people pleasing and the willingness to disappoint or upset someone else rather than disappoint or upset yourself. When you're able to own that and understand the, I love you. I'm sorry you're disappointed, but it's more important for me to take care of myself first. And I hope you are able to do the same. Like when you're able to embody that, that mm-hmm. is a huge piece of permission that you're not only giving yourself, but you're also giving that other person. Oh, I love that so, so much. I just saw a meme on social media today that was basically that same sentiment. Like if you're willing to disappoint others in your life, chances are it's because you're taking care of yourself. Yeah. Because, yeah. 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 Mm. Well, Sandra, I so appreciate your coming on the podcast and sharing your wisdom. If you could let listeners know how they could find you if they were interested in working with you or knowing more about you. Yeah, sure. So I am the hyphenate entrepreneur. So if you're interested in having some help with your technology or your marketing systems and just kind of getting that out of the way in a non-hustle manner so that you can be more visible and have more impact, you can go to sandrafixmytech.com. And Mm -hmm. if you were interested in the things we were talking about around aligned productivity and matching your habits and your actions with your values and letting go of the the perfectionism and the hustle culture, you can go to feelmoreproductive.com. Nice. Awesome. Well, thank you, Sandra. I so appreciate your coming on the podcast. Thank you so much, Biz. It was a blast. Oh, I just love that conversation with Sandra Halling. I have struggled with how I want to be as a entrepreneur and business person and living my life the way I know the space that I need in order to feel relaxed, not overwhelmed, feel like I am doing my best work and living my best life. And from week to week, depending on how much I have on my plate, that shifts. But I am not a hustle person. I find that when I am too overbooked, when I look at my schedule, like she said, when it's all teal, I do not have my schedule color coded. But when I look at my schedule and it's all client meetings or all business meetings and client meetings, and there's no space 
for me to reflect or be creative in particular to be creative, like that's hard. I, I get, I begin to resent the work that I do and I don't want to be in that space. So when I can write, when I can bring forth new ideas into my work, when I can learn new things, like that's what I'm all about. So really refreshing to talk to Sandra and her insight into corporate culture and what we as women entrepreneurs and business owners can do differently. So I hope you'll check out her website and all of her good stuff. Again, if you're interested in getting the podcast in your mailbox every other week when I put it up, sign up for the newsletter. You can sign up at elizabethcushcoaching.com forward slash sign up and you get a free gift. You get a journal with some prompts on uh, how to energetically align yourself with your values. So pretty good stuff there. All right. Well, have a great week and I look forward to connecting with you next time here on the podcast. Thanks for listening to the Awaken Your Wise Woman podcast. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. Music by Andy Cush, sound editing by Laura Disler, and show notes by Kathy Cush. If you'd like more information about me, Biz Cush, and the resources shared today, go to awakenyourwisewoman.com.